addition of angular momentum. It's challenging because um, the idea is you're trying to combine, you know, two. Oh, sorry. You're trying to combine two angular momentum vectors, J1 and J2. And you know that each one has its own set of eigenstates, right? You know that this one is labeled by a J1, M1, and this one is labeled by a J2, M2. And you also know that uh, there's two J1 plus one num value, possible values for M, right? And that many values for, um, for, for, for this other one. And you know that, you know, you have the associated Hilbert spaces. You can have a Hilbert space, you know, associated with a fixed value of J1. And you can have a Hilbert space associated with a fixed value of J2. So like, for instance, we had looked for a long time at qubits, right? That was J is equal to a half. So then there's two values for M plus one half and minus one half, that's the spin up and down. Well, we can also have spin one, and then that has three different um, possible values for M, the plus or minus one and zero, it's three components. And those guys are um, that space of states, so those three states, those transforms transform like just regular vectors, like, because there's three components and you can sort of relate the M plus or minus one components to the X and Y components of a vector. And then the zeroth one is like the Z component of a vector. So the way those plus or minus states and the zero state, the way they all rotate into each other, those Ms, the M zero and plus or minus one, the way those three components rotate into each other is um, analogous to the way vectors rotate. So, but then there's higher ones, you know, nothing's stopping us from choosing higher quantum numbers. We could look at, you know, angular momentum two that has five different possible values for M. And so the point is, what happens when you combine two, two angular momenta? Well, then your system has two different angular momentum. And so in principle, the Hilbert space becomes, you know, a tensor product. You know, I have, you know, this for um, one of your, for, for describing that one angular momentum, and then this guy, this sober space describing the other angular momentum. And so the states, right, would just be, um, would just be labeled by the, you know, you, you could construct a basis, right, for the sober space, and it would be described by um, the individual eigenstates of J1 and J2. So that's a possible basis, right? You could have a basis like this, J1, uh, J2, and M1, M2. And that would correspond to, this is just a notation thing, for the tensor product, right, between J1 and uh, J2 like this. So that, that could be a basis. This is uh, a basis for this tensor product um, Hilbert space. But it's, it's a bad basis. The problem is that under a rotation of the whole system, the M1 and M2s, they might rotate into each other. They might mix. So it's not a very nice basis because it's not written in a way where it's clear how the states rotate. Because if you rotate the whole thing, then the M1s and M2s, they might mix with each other. So it's not a convenient basis for that reason. Um, you could say that it doesn't uh, rotate in a nice way. When we apply a rotation, these guys can get all mixed up. Uh, you'll have some linear combination of them generally. And that's not good. So, what we do is we have to find a better basis. 
And a better basis would be um, the following, it would be the thing, would be the basis that corresponds to um, diagonalizing uh, J1 squared, J2 squared. That's of course, you know, the J1, J2. So we'll keep those around. Remember these guys, uh, the J1, J2s, they're the quantum numbers associated with the total angular, with the angular momentum squared. So th those are scalar quantities. They don't, it doesn't rotate like J1 and J2, that's fixed if you rotate around. Um, so the issue is with these Ms, these Ms don't rotate into a nice way because, you know, they can mix. So you want to do that. And then the other thing you want to do is make sure that the total angular momentum is diagonalized. That's a really nice quantity because that definitely doesn't rotate. So, you know, if you fix the total angular momentum quantum number to some J, that won't change under rotations. And so then the thing you have left over is, of course, the total angular momentum along the uh, Z component, M1 plus M2. That's a much nicer quantum number because that that'll just rotate. The total Z component will rotate, but everything else will stay the same. So that's a much nicer basis um, to use. So this basis would look like the following, right? You would have J1, J2, then you have a quantum number for the total angular momentum, and then you would have a angular momentum for the, the Z component of the total angular momentum. That's a better basis. And now the whole point of um, addition of angular momentum is figuring out how to connect this tensor product basis with the uh, nicer basis. How do you connect these two up? Um, so that's the idea. And um, we already kind of know an example of this. And that's uh, adding two spin one half particles together. So that would be, you know, adding two, two spin one half angular momenta. We already know how that works. So what we know is um, in general, right, there will be, um, and I'll show this more rigorous, rigorously later, but we um, should have, you probably have seen this in undergraduate, but there's, um, so first of all, we could do the easy thing, right? We know that the dimension of the Hilbert space, right, of, Two, these two spin one halves is four, it's two times two. That, that's true in general, that the dimension here is two J one plus one times uh, two J two plus one, right? Because tensor product Hilbert space. Here the dimension is four, because it's two times two. Um, so, and we, so we know, we'll need to somehow break up. And so what's, what's our usual basis, right? What's this guy? This guy for our example, right, is just uh, this, this thing, right? That would be this basis, this bad basis um, of tensor product states. I mean, it's not bad, it's just not convenient in terms of rotations. But now remember that I showed you that um, there is a linear combination of these guys, right? That um, doesn't rotate. Uh, and that was the, uh, the uh, spin singlet state. So what do you think the value of the total angular momentum is for, for that state? It was uh, the following state. What do you think the total angular momentum is of this state? Is it zero? Yes, it's zero, that's right. It's zero because um, this is just a single state that doesn't rotate at all. 
So it, you know, it doesn't transform to some other state under rotations, it stays the same. That's the characteristic of the J equals zero, right? The J equals zero has just one state associated with it. So one dimensional Hilbert space. Um, so under rotations, you know, you just stay in that Hilbert space and um, now that's it. You just, <laughs> it's uh, completely invariant under rotations. So that's one possibility for the total angular momentum. And, but then we still have three states left over and those three states uh, form the triplet. And they would naturally have, um, well, we can sort of figure out what it is. One of the states, you know, is probably gonna be like up, up, right? That has total angular momentum. Um, that has total angular momentum um, uh, one, right? Because it's plus one half plus one half. The magnitude of that. So it's uh, this has j is equal to one, and the rest so and the rest of the states just fill, fill up that um, fill out that. Uh, Uh, fill out that uh, angular momentum quantum number. So there's four of them, right? The singlet and then these three triplet states. And that's it. And this is the better basis, right? This is the uh, uh, better basis. Uh, I guess I, I drew it in blue. Why is it better? Is because it's now divided into little groups of states that rotate into each other and don't, you know, can't transition between themselves um, under rotations, right? Like these three states rotate into each other. You can of course take the up, up and rotate it, you know, into down, down. Um, and, and so all these rotate into each other. And then this one just rotates into itself. The, uh, the J equals zero just rotates into itself. So you can see that this basis breaks down your states into little irreducible subsets that rotate into themselves and other, otherwise don't, can't rotate into each other. Little, little subspaces, little irreducible um, subspaces of, of, of rotation here that just where the states just rotate amongst themselves. And now you can sort of, you know, we, we can write down what these are. This is, of course, the one. So if, if we label these as JM, right? Of course, J1, J, J1 is equal to J2 is equal to uh, one half, of course. This is two spin one halves. Um, so the JM piece in this nice basis, of course, so this is the one, one, right? This is the one minus one, makes sense. If you got two minus a halves, that gives you a total M of, you know, minus a half, minus a half, minus one. And this must be the one zero state, right? And this over here, this is the zero, uh, zero state in this, in, this, in this better basis notation. So we've already, we already seen it. So, we, you know, we've already kind of done this. Um, but now let's do it more generally for, you know, J1, J2. Any questions about that though? This example and what we're doing here, the general scheme. Okay, so that's the general scheme. So let's write down like some facts, I guess about <laughs> about this, um, about, you know, addition of angular momentum. So first of all, if we have one of these tensor product states, J1, J2, M1, M2, this is an eigenvector of uh, the total angular momentum JZ component uh, with um, M is equal to uh, M1 plus M2. So if you're just thinking about angular momentum along the Z direction, 
um, it's easy because we've already diagonalized along that direction. And so the quantum numbers just add there and total, total angular momentum in that direction, you know, that it's quantum numbers, just the sum of the individual ones. So we kind of know how that goes. And then fact two is if we, um, if we fix, if we fix a J that is a quantum number uh, of the total angular momentum squared, then we could in principle apply the raising and lowering operator, right? To move us between the different M values. And this is often how you construct um, the angular momentum states. And of course, the raising and lowering ones, the raising and lowering operator is just the sum of the raising and lowering operator for um, the two, for the two subsystems. So that's often, you can often use that to, um, to go through um, the various states. So to make a connection between, because you know how these guys, you know how these guys act on the tensor product states. And you know how this uh, should act on um, the, you know, the better basis states. Uh, and so you can make a connection between these two using the raising and lowering operator. And you'll practice some of that on the homework. This is called the sort of raising and lowering operator method. And you know how to do that because we, we already derived how the plus or minus operators act on um, angular momentum states, right? You had that complicated square root thing of, you know, J, J plus one and so on. So you can use that. Um, and maybe I'll do an example in recitation to help, to help with the homework. But the point is, um, the point is, if we do that, there should be uh, two J plus one values of um, M, right? If we fix a J, we apply raising and lowering to like try to figure out what the ladder is, right? We should get a ladder of two J plus one states, right? That's sort of, that's what we know about angular momentum. But we don't know, what we don't know is whether or not there's a degeneracy. So that's a question. Is uh, there any uh, degeneracy? And we'll see if the answer is no, but in principle, you might have um, that there's multiple vectors, right? Multiple states associated with each rung of the ladder for the total J. Right, so the idea is we sort of, we have two rungs, right? One for the J1 and one for J2. And then we have uh, a rung for, a set of rungs for J and M, right? For, for these guys. Uh, for a fixed J, we have some rungs corresponding to the M values. And so we would just wanna know uh, what's the connection between these rungs. So for example, um, here, right? we had uh, two rungs for, you know, J1 and J2 as a two spin one halves. And we saw that this broke down into a single rung, that's the singlet, and then um, uh, three rungs for the uh, uh, triplet. And you see there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, but now all we're gonna do is show that this kind of one to one corresponds. There's four here, and then you know that it breaks up like this for any J one and J two. It always works this way. Um, that's the idea, and you can show that um, by considering um, N J. This this could be the number. Uh, this is, could be the um, degeneracy of um, the M rungs for a uh, fixed uh, total angular momentum number J. So we just have to show that this is equal to one basically. 
Um, so how do we do that? That's sort of fact three is suppose there are um, n as a function of m uh, vectors or states, you know, states with eigenvalue m of jz, right? Then we know we know that um, j has to be greater or equal to the absolute value of m, right? Because m runs between minus j and j. So if you have some value m here, then you know that the j associated with it must be, you know, at least equal to m or bigger, right? M can't exceed j, that, you know, so we have to have this. So that means that this little nm must be the sum of j, right? All the possible j's that are bigger and are equal to the absolute value of m. And then if we have any of this degeneracy, then it must be n sub j, right? We have to add if there's any degeneracy in, each of the, in any of the rungs, then we have to add, add up that degeneracy. And so this expression here is the total number of states that we have with this eigenvalue of m, right? What we would do is we would add all the possible values of j that we could have, which would must be all the j's that are bigger than or equal to the absolute value of m. And then we must also add up the degeneracies. We'll see there is no degeneracy. This is always just one, but we don't know so far. And we just, you know, that's, that's what we have. And from this, you can see that you can actually write the degeneracy in terms of um, the little n. Right, the little n is a sum. It's like n, um, n uh, you know, magnitude of m plus n magnitude of m plus one and so on. So um, if you wanted nj, you would take little n evaluated at j, which would be, you know, nj plus nj plus one and so on, minus, you know, nj plus one minus dot, dot, dot. So these cancel and you get just equal to nj. So that's what it is. So you can write the degeneracy in terms of the little n. And the little n is actually really easy to calculate because it's just a number of ways of having uh, m1 and m2 add up to m. Because remember here, what we know that these states, which we're trying to connect up to the better basis, we know that these are already eigenstates of the z component of angular momentum with the total angular momentum quantum number along that direction, just the sum of these two. So any kind of degeneracy we might have, um, it, we'll already have figured it out if we figure out how to, uh, you know, number all these states that correspond to a fixed little m. And what are those? It's just the number of ways of adding two numbers together to get m. It's the ways of number of ways of adding m1 and m2 to get m. So um, little n sub m, is, sub m is easy to calculate. Well, easy, you know, sort of. But we can at least say it. It's just the number of ways. Uh, it's the number of ways uh, that m is equal to m1 plus m2. And you can calculate what it is. Um, it's a little bit tedious, so this requires like some kind of, you know, it's a fun math puzzle, I guess, <laughs> but you can, you, you, you can sort of see how it works in a picture. So we put M1 up here and M2 over here, and you start, and you know, they're, they're spaced, this is C0, and they're spaced by integers, you know, and this goes from, you know, minus J1 to plus J1, and this guy runs from 
minus J2 to uh, plus J2. They'll form uh, you know, a grid, like a rectangle, a box thing. This is all the different states we have. I'm, I'm literally labeling all the angular momentum states, right? Because the angular, it, it, why is this basis is nice. Why is it nice? Because it's easy to count it. It's very easy to count this. We know M1 and M2 ranges from minus, you know, J1 to plus J2. And we, we know we know how it, the numbers, um, it's easy to count, but it behaves poorly under rotations. But it's nice because we can use it at least for counting. So you get this, these are all the different states, right? M1 ranges from plus J1 to minus J1. J2 range, M2 ranges from minus J2 to plus J2. So you get all those states. And if we fix M is equal to M1 plus M2, that corresponds to um, two diagonal lines through, um, through, through this uh, grid, right? So like here for this one, this would be zero is equal to M1 plus M2, right? So M1 would be minus M2. That, that's what these are. Here it's zero, zero. Here, you know, M1 is plus one and M2 is minus one. So they add up to zero. And this is, you know, two minus two and so on. So um, I guess I drew this kind of funny, but you, hopefully you see the point here. This would be, um, this would be right, um, this guy right here would be two is equal to M1 plus M2, right? That's that. All these points here satisfy this condition, right? Because here M1, M2 is zero and M1 is two up here and vice versa here. So it all, it all works out. So all you have to do is for each value of M, figure out how many points there are on these diagonals. And it's like a quote unquote fun math puzzle. That's not, I mean, so we know how to do it. It's just, it's a little bit tedious because you have to go through the cases, um, right? Because there's more dots here and there's fewer. And uh, once you get up here, this is where uh, you get only one state. And for that state, of course, that's kind of the maximum that you can get. That's when M is equal to J1 plus J2. Right, it's sort of the maximum uh, total angular momentum in the z direction. So there's only one state corresponding to that. Anyway, uh, so you can do that. You can, you know, play that game of figuring out what uh, what, what those things are. And what you find is you can actually calculate what it is. Well, first of all, when the absolute value of M is bigger than uh, J1 plus J2, right? Then there's no states like that, right? Then you run off this rectangle, right? You can't get more M than the sum of the, the two angular momentum. Um, then there's the intermediate case where you're in these short little diagonals. In that case, you get uh, J1 plus J2 uh, minus one minus the absolute value of M and that's for all M's between the absolute value of J1 minus J2 and um, J1 plus J2. Let's check to see if it works. Suppose M is equal to J1 plus J2. Um, oh, I think, so I must be, I think I'm missing should be a plus, All right? Um, so if M is equal to J1 plus J2, right? There should be just one state corresponding to that. That's this one in the corner. And yeah, J1 plus J2 minus that. Um, then there's also one in this bottom corner. That's where M is minus J1 minus J2. Uh, and that works also. So I think th this should be correct. And otherwise, um, there will be uh, two J2 um, 
plus one, and that's when this ranges from J two. Okay, so I think I think that works. Um, let's check some more, I guess. Uh, for zero here, we have uh, zero. You know, it goes from well, yeah. So it goes here from there's one, two, three, four, five of them. So it goes. So it's it's actually to be a little bit. More specific, it's sort of the minimum between. Um, this is sort of assuming that um, J2 is less than or equal to J1, right? So in this case, we sort of drew things so that, um, um, well, you can imagine if J2 is two, right? Then it would go from two minus two to plus two over here along the J2 axis. And there's indeed two J2 plus one states, right? It's along this diagonal. Yeah, I think you can sort of convince yourself that it should always be that way. So say, wait, let's say J, um, so we have to make sure that J2 is smaller than J1. So let's say J1 is three or something, and J2 is uh, two, then you would have uh, this kind of deal. So this is the J2 axis here. Let, let's see if I got this right. Do, do, do. All right, so if, if we go over here, we look at all the possible states with uh, M1 plus M2 is equal to zero, it would be just these five, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so when M, so for these long diagonals, um, you always get five states where it's five because that's sort of the borders of this rectangle, assuming that the J2 you know, is smaller than J1. So you can do this counting, you can get this formula. Um, it's not so important. Um, it's not so important what the precise formula is. It's just important that you recognize how this is done, you know? We're grouping uh, these states into groups where the sum of the Ms is equal to some fixed value. And you could get an expression for um, the numbers of states along each diagonal if you wanted, or you could just draw it for any given case and see what it is. Um, okay, and from this calculation, what you can conclude is that um, using this expression, we can now substitute that, that in to, um, to this guy from fact three. And what you would find is that, um, n j is equal to one uh, for the following values of uh, of j, and n j is equal to zero otherwise, and that's it. So the degeneracy is always one, and the possible values of j they range from the absolute value of the difference between j one and j two and then the sum of J1 and J2. And there's no degeneracy. And you can even check that it all works um, because the dimensions all add up. So you can uh, check the following. You can check that if you add up all of the Js that run between uh, J1 minus J2 and uh, J1 plus J2, and there's of course two J plus one values of M, rungs of the ladder, right? For each of these Js. If you add all those up, you'll get uh, two J one plus one 
times 2j2 plus 1. So you get all the rungs of the component um, angular momentum. So again, this is adding up, you know, all the rungs for the different values of j. And this, these are the rungs for the individual uh, angular momentums for m1 and m2. And these are all the rungs for the different possible j's, the m, possible m values for a fixed j. And they all add together. They, they all, it all works. There's no degeneracy, meaning that um, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the rungs of the ladders here and the rungs of the ladders here in these little J subspaces. And how many different J's are there? How many spaces are there? It's all the J's, all the integers between uh, J1 minus J2 absolute value and J1 plus J2. All right. So in our easy example, of course, we had J1 and J2 equals equal to half. So J had to range from zero to uh, one half plus one half, which is one. So there's only two possibilities, zero and one. In zero, there's one rung of the ladder and one, there's three rungs of the ladder, there's four states. And that corresponds to the four dimensional Hilbert space of the tensor product between the two and one half. So all I'm saying here is that it works exactly the same way for, um, for uh, an arbitrary tensor product of uh, Hilbert spaces here. What's it mean? It means like that the Hilbert space, that's the tensor product of J1 you know, and J2, those two angular momentum uh, quantum numbers, that that Hilbert space you can write as a tensor product now of individual Hilbert spaces, right, of, um, and I, I should, this is more of an addition, I guess, the Hilbert spaces of all the different component of, of the total Js that run from um, J1 minus J2 and J1 plus J2. So it should, it's more like plus. So any state in here, right, um, any state in here, any of these red rungs would correspond to one of the blue rungs, um, or their numbers at least match. Of course, they're not, um, their total number matches, but of course, there'll be some complicated relationship between these rungs and these rungs, but at least the total number matches, so there's no degeneracy. Um, so that, that's the idea. Um, any questions about that? I'm sort of long-winded, um, but hopefully you see what we're doing here. Um, conceptually. No, I think uh, that was pretty helpful to actually show, you know, uh, what it means and just going through the formulas, you know, to put a picture to it to me is better. So you can kind of correlate it, you know. Um, so thank you. Um, in the grid, uh, is there a specific reason that you went from minus two to plus two? No, just as an example, I don't know. Okay. Now it's just an example, but it, the idea is, again, you have um, M1 and M2, and these range from minus J2 to plus J2 and plus J1 and minus J1. So these form a grid, a square lattice and, you know, and all we're doing is we're trying to figure out how these states connect to the ones where you fix a J and an M. And we do that by just focusing on the M. And we know that M is always gonna be equal to M1 plus M2. So we have to figure out the number of these states that correspond to a fixed M. And those guys just live along these diagonals. Yeah, I mean, it was clear what you did. Um. And then it's a little like a fun math puzzle to figure out what the number of dots are on each diagonal. And it's given by this kind of, you know, sort of complicated expression. But the expression itself is not important. What's important is you can use this expression to figure out if there's any kind of degeneracy. If the total number of dots here is different somehow than um, 
the total number of um, dots that would correspond to having a fixed uh, J and M, right? And we saw that there isn't. You can, okay, let me just summarize again, maybe in a nicer way. You can either label everything with M1, M2, that's the bad basis, or you can label things with J and M, that's the good basis. And these M1s and 2s runs, run from J1, you know, from minus J1 to plus J1, and these go from minus J2 to plus J2. These guys, they run from J1 minus J2, all the way up to J1 plus J2. And these Ms, of course, run from minus J to J. And the number of states in, the, in this good basis is equal to the number of states in this bad basis. That, and that, that's all there is to it. That's what all this counting is all about, really. It's just proving that. Um, you know, we already saw it for the spin one half. All right, more questions? Okay, so now that we have done that, it's easy enough to uh, start thinking about transforming between the bad basis and the good basis. So that's done with uh, the so-called uh, Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. So what you do is, uh, if you want a state in the good basis, that's of course related to a sum over all the M1s and M2s that add up to M, right? And we have to add all the component states, J1, J2 of the bad basis, as I call it. And there'll be some coefficients and these coefficients they will be labeled by J1 and J2, the two component things. Of course, they might depend on M1 and M2. And then of course, they'll depend on the state that you wanna get out in the good basis, the JM. So this is the notation for the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. What are they saying? It's, the co it's how you connect the bad basis to the good basis. And it's the connection between M1 and M2 here and J and M for some fixed values of J1 and J2. And that's all it is. Um, and what these really are, right? They're just the inner products between the two basis um, states, right? Between the good and the bad basis. This is what I call the good one, what I call the bad one. I mean, they're not really good or bad, you know, but um, this one rotates in a much nicer way. Again, remember J1, J2, and J, they don't rotate. Only the M piece rotates. Here, J1, J2 doesn't rotate, but both M1 and M2 rotate. So they can get all mixed up. So that's not good. Basically, what you did, like you said, the reason why you think it's good because you're separating them into four components that are the smallest you can possibly get them into, right? versus yes, the other you're, one. You're, you're breaking to... them down into groups of states that mm -hmm. form the smallest set of states that rotate into each other, right? It's, we're breaking down these groups of sta these states into groups, such as the singlet and the triplet, right? That yeah. all rotate into each other um, and form sort of irreducible segments of, of uh, rotation here, because all the, for the fixed J1, J2, and J, these, those are all fixed under rotations. So the J now labels different, those different groups, right? The singlet, the triplet, and so on. So now- For arbitrary angular momentum. Okay, yeah, so you said arbitrary. That's what I was wondering. I was gonna ask you. So this works for just about anything then. Uh, we could do any, this. Any two angular momentum. So we spent a lot of time adding two spin one halves, but you could have added, a common thing to do is add a spin one half to an orbital angular momentum, which could be any integer quantum number. So that's a common thing to do is, uh, you know, when we do spin orbit coupling, which I guess we'll do next semester. Um, but it's all here, the, the theory is all here. Um, and of course, these guys will have some 
um, orthonormality conditions because this is just they're just these are just the Klebsch Gordon coefficients are just the unitary transformations for change of basis. It's just a change of basis for the same Hilbert space. So it's got lots of you know properties like uh, if you sum over m1 and um, m2 right of c j1 j2 m1 m2 uh, jm c m1 m2 j1 j2 and you have some other j prime m prime well you can use the properties of inner products of between basis states to conclude that this must just be uh, just must give us the orthonormality condition between the good basis vectors. Um, you can of course do the backwards thing where you sum over the bad, the good, um, you trace over the good. So these, this is the bad basis that we're summing over. You can alternatively sum over J from J1 minus J2 up to J1 plus J2 and then sum over all the associated m's, right, from minus j to j. Uh, right, you got, and if you put m1 prime, m2 prime, um, that's equal to, to the following. Again, just comes from orthonormality between the individual basis types, so this, you know, and the completeness for, for the other type. So, you, you know, it, all of this is, it's just doing one of these, right? It's like, uh, you know, it, it's all we're doing where the P prime would be, you know, the other basis. That's all it is. They're still just basis vectors for the tensor product Hilbert space of the, uh, the sum of those two spins, the J1 and J2. So you got all these kinds of relationships. Um, all right. Um, so hopefully you see that, you know, Klebsch Gordon coefficients, they're not, they're nothing scary. They're just the unitary, they're just the transformation elements associated with going from this. M1, M2 basis to this JM basis. That's all they are. And then you can use, you know, these kinds of, you can play these kinds of games with completeness relation and orthonormality between these basis vectors to get all kinds of some rules for the Klebsch Gordon coefficients. Um, but it's nothing particularly mysterious. It's just the same old uh, Hilbert space quantum mechanics stuff. So, um, all right. So let's now tie it all together, right? And um, think about how this relates to um, the unitaries representing certain rotations. And remember that we saw that um, the matrix elements of these unitary operators are equal to these D matrices, right? But now we can use Klebsch Gordon coefficients to decompose this JM basis into, say, um, a J1, J2 type of basis where you would sum over M1, uh, M2, M1 uh, prime, M2 prime. And here you have the Klebsch Gordons. And all this is multiplied by J1, J2, M1, M2, U of R, J1, J2, M1 prime, M2 prime. So we can decompose the J and M, right? Using the klebsch gordon coefficients on both sides, we can decompose them using the klebsch gordon coefficients. Um, and this will give us a recipe, right, for going between 
these D matrices correspond to, corresponding to a fixed J and M and M prime here, these components to this guy. And these are nothing but um, a product of two, um, of two of the D matrices. Why? Because this basis corresponds to having two you know, independent angular momenta, right? Two states, it's a tensor product state of J1, M1 prime and J2, M2 prime, right? So we can write this U as just a tensor product of the two of the rotation applying to both of those angular momentum, angular momenta. And so all this is, right, is D corresponding to some J1, uh, M1, M1 prime here. Um, and then the J2 piece, M2, M2 prime. So you see then, this D matrix is connected via the klebsch gordon coefficients to products of, you know, two D matrices um, with two different uh, angular momentum J1, J2. It's a way you can decompose a, any given D matrix into some component J1 and J2. And the J1 and J2 is arbitrary. You can choose whatever you want. Um, so, so yeah, and then you could also do the reverse. You could take two D matrices uh, corresponding to some J1 and some J2, and you know M1, M1 prime, M2, M2 prime of some rotation R, and you can decompose those into a sum over possible Js uh, ranging from J1 minus J2 up to J1 plus J2. And now you have the Klebsch Gordons. Um, So you can also get these summation rules for combining matrices of two different Js, these D matrices into sums of D matrices for a J, you know, corresponding to the total angular momentum that ranges from J1 minus J2 to J1 plus J2. And all this is is just L matrix, applying those basis rules that we have here uh, to matrix elements of U. And these matrix elements of U are, of course, the Wigner D matrices. So you can derive all sorts of nice uh, summation rules that connect different D matrices together. And again, the whole theme here is that we're taking um, uh, the rotations associated with a particular J1 and a particular J2, and we're decomposing them into rotations um, of the total angular momentum sort of subspaces, which range from um, from J1 minus J2 absolute value, all these subspaces all the way up to J1 plus J2. That's what we're doing. We're breaking up rotations uh, of component of these two angular momentum that we're summing into uh, rotations that just live within these subspaces of total angular momentum. Again, this is all this saying, it's an abstract way of saying you can take two spin one halves or spin whatever and whatever and decompose them into little subgroups that rotate into themselves, the singlet and the triplet. It's a very general thing. Any J1 and J2 breaks down into little subgroups ranging from total angular momentum J1 minus J2 all the way up to J1 plus J2. All right, so that's the connection to the D matrices. You can now use these basis vectors to understand things about the D matrices. And the final thing I wanna mention, I think I will probably not finish. I'll need like five minutes in the next class, but that's the uh, Wigner-Eckhart theorem. And let me just start it. The idea is very simple. All you wanna do it's a little bit like adding three angular momenta instead of just two. And where you would ever wanna do this is if you have um, an operator that transforms like one of those JM states. And 
this operator might be some T and it might, it'll have an associated J and some associated M, like the components. So remember we had vector operators, right? They had like a VX, VY, VZ. Uh, oh, there's something in the chat. Oh. That no, was just me. I just posted the wiki showing a little bit more of what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can read the wiki. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but your your March like doesn't get a direct feedback. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so what's the idea here is that we want to know how what the matrix elements of these operators. Uh, so as I was saying, so we had these vector operators, but we could have just as easily constructed, say, uh, a T uh, one operator, and then the M's would range, you know, from there be a T zero a T1 minus one and a T1 plus one for the different M values. And remember those three guys, they're related to each other. Uh, the T0 is like the VZ and the T1 minus one, they are linear combinations of VX and VY. In particular, VX plus or minus IVY, those are the spherical, um, those are the uh, plus or minus one components of, um, the associated spherical uh, tensor operator. So again, this is a vector operator. These guys are called spherical tensor operators. They're a generalization of you know, a vector uh, and so on, um, but they're labeled by, not by these Cartesian components, but by the spherical um, quantum numbers, the ones associated with a particular J and a particular M. And that's really the only, that's what the wigner eckert theorem is about. It tells you how do you compute a spherical tensor like this? How do you compute its matrix elements with some other J prime, M prime, and some other J double prime, M double prime? It tells you about that. And let me, first I'll state the theorem and then maybe next time in the last five minutes, I will, um, I will tell you how to prove it. Um, but I just want to at least leave you with the statement of the theorem. The st statement of the theorem is if you take any T and let me, I'm not going to call it JM because I'll need JM for some of these other things. I'll just call it a Q and K. Kind of awkward, but again, the Q is like the J and then the K ranges from you know minus Q to plus Q. These matrix elements between sandwiched between some states, the alpha is anything else that's not related to angular momentum, could be like the energy level or something, or the principal quantum number for a hydrogen atom. It could be some, some other quantum number. The matrix elements between uh, Jm and J prime M prime M prime is equal to the following. It's equal to the Klepsch Gordon coefficient of what? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to add the first two angular momentum type pieces, the Q and J. So it corresponds to um, uh, oh, sorry, I guess I have the uh, this notation is not okay. So this is a little I should I should have written this like J. Um, this is better. Yeah, so sorry about that. I, fl I, flipped, I flipped the way these are defined. So this is the J is down here and the M is up here. So this guy is, is like the J of this guy and, and the Q is the thing that ranges from minus K uh, to plus K. So what are we doing here? We're adding J and K together first. So there's a Klebsch-Gordon coefficient associated with J, K. That's like the J1, J2. And then the component M's, right? The associated M with J is just M here. This is like M1. What's M2? It must be the Q. So this is Q. And then what are we doing? We're like converting these two guys into something that is J prime M prime. So the coefficient here is J prime M prime. Remember that the general form of this Klebsch-Gordon is J1, J2, we're adding J1, J2 in the bad basis and we're getting something that's JM like that. So this is the conceptual kind of, this is how you would remember maybe the Wigner-Eckert theorem if you ever forgot it. You're taking this 
ket and you're adding it with the angular momentum associated with the spherical tensor. And you're trying to get something that's the bra because that's the only time you would get like a non-zero value for um, the, this matrix element. The angular momentum I have to add together appropriately. So it's given by this Klebsch coordinate. And then what's left over is called a reduced matrix element where all it depends on are the things that don't rotate. Um, and that's this reduced matrix element. And see, it has all the M's dropped. Um, it's got everything here dropped. All that's left over is the J's, the TK, right? The J and the J prime. And this is a statement of the theorem that all of the M dependence, all of the things that depend on the choice of coordinate system, because remember M is a uh, quantization along the Z direction, which is arbitrary. All of the behavior of those M pieces are entirely captured by the klebsch gordon coefficients, which are just some numbers that you can look up in the table. So you see the wigner eckhart theorem tells you how to compute spherical tensor matrix elements um, in a nice way where you actually don't need to know the M dependence at all because that's all captured by the klebsch gordon coefficients. All you need to know is how all the J's, um, the matrix elements associated with the J's. So this you can calculate, this piece you can calculate by setting M's to zero or something like that. Because everything about the M's, the Q, the M and the M prime, it's all captured by these klebsch gordon coefficients. That's the contents of the wigner eckhart theorem. I will probably in next class, um, I don't know, uh, maybe prove it and maybe show a quick example of it or something, but at least, wanted to write it down for you so you can at least say it now. You've seen every all the results, all the main results in the class. But um, since we're out of time, I'll, I'll do a little bit more next class, I guess. Um, but there it is, that's the last bit. Um, but you can think about wigner eckhart as just um, connecting up three different kinds of angular momentum, JM, uh, KQ, and J prime, M prime, when you're trying to compute matrix elements of spherical tensor operators.